You're now experiencing data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. I'm really excited to share my chat with Dr. Andre Sharapov today from Lidl, the large grocery store chain in Europe. Andre is a data scientist. I met him at Predictive Analytics World while we were speaking there. And he told me that he was quite interested in removing the black from the black box concept that goes with predictive models. This is called explainable AI or XAI. And I think this has a lot of relevancy to designing good decision support tools and good analytics that people can believe in and will engage with. There's obviously been a lot of talk about this area, uh, whether it's from a compliance perspective or an ethics perspective or just a, you know, a customer and end user experience perspective, being able to tell what models are doing and how they're deriving their predictions has value on multiple different levels. So without getting super into the technical side of this, we're going to talk about how explainability within machine learning and predictive models has relevancy to the design and user experience of your software applications. So here's my chat with Andre. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to, to Experiencing Data. This is Brian, and I'm happy to have Dr. Andre Sharapov from Lidl. Did I say that right? So Lidl, obviously, is a gross, not obviously, maybe to our American listeners, people that don't live in Europe, but is it Lidl or Lidl, the grocery store chain in Europe? It's Lidl. That's right. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to uh, the show, Andre. So you're a, a senior data scientist at Lidl. Tell us about your your background. What are you doing over at? Uh, what are you doing with grocery data? Yeah, oh, hi Brian, and then um, thanks for having me on the podcast. Yeah, as uh, as you said, Lidl is one of the largest retailers in the in Europe. So we have more than ten thousand stores, and uh, we obviously have quite a lot of data that we're trying to put to work at the moment by building various data products. So for instance, we try to create decision support tools in order to help our action planners or promotion planners to make better decisions. On the other side, we're automating various processes, like for instance, auto disposition, which means ordering of uh, goods automatically for, for all the stores. Yeah, a lot of other use cases related to marketing and um, Everything that has to do with business is legal, more or less. I'm excited to talk to you about a particular area of interest that you have, which is explainable AI. But before we, we get into that, I'm curious. So, so it sounds like you're, you've touched several different aspects of the business at Lidl with some of the, the data products that you're creating. What's hard about getting that right? Not so much from the technical standpoint and you know the engineering and the data science piece, but in terms of there's someone's doing the purchasing, right, of the carrots and someone's doing the planning of the promotions. Tell us about that experience and how you go about getting those people the information they need such that they're willing to use your analytics and your decision support tools to actually make decisions. Like, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, sure. So as you've pointed out correctly, these days, it's not really much about technology or you know data crunching, but more about kind of weaving together the relationship between data scientists and the business in order to get a buy-in from from the, the actual users. Let me maybe just say a little bit about how how we worked on our first data product, the one that I created. Well, of course, not alone with the team. Yeah, we went through a lot of struggles, kind of trying to figure out what data scientists do or do any data engineers. And then at some point, we've got product owners on the team, the people who actually talk to the business in a, well, in the language that the business understands. We also got, you know, business people on board as advisors for our, for the project, so to say. So the product that we built is called, uh, planning tools, so to say, right? So every week, every week, these people, the operational people plan a promotion save for a certain date in the future. And they have to take a certain number of decisions, I don't know, take into account conditions of the market, weather, you know, time of the season, and a lot of other things. 
and then come up with a number in order to, well, a number to order. The the sole purpose of the tool that we built was to make their work more efficient in a sense that they could not only produce better results in terms of accuracy, but they could also learn about the, the market themselves because we created a, a certain plot, for instance, elasticity curves, and they, they could play with the price and see, okay, if, 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 they, if they make a price too high or too low and how much the ordering quantity would change. So that was the main idea behind the product. I guess most companies have the, the, the same problem of trying to onboard the, the business users and the, the, the main sort of idea or the main way of thinking, okay, we have AI in that, so they will certainly use it. Okay, let, let's just do it. <laughs> well, but it, it, it looks like it's not that easy, right? So, and we went through this experience of learning that, okay, <laughs> although we have the coolest algorithms in our system and we have the coolest people working for us as data scientists and engineers, it totally doesn't mean that the, the final user will use the product. The ways that we tried to convince them was by building fancy user interfaces in terms of, you know, ma- making it more beautiful, so to say, right? But nonetheless, they were not very convinced. As far as I know, the operational people are, are really hard to convince because maybe the, the majority of operational people try to use such tools in order to execute certain tasks very fast. Right, they don't have a lot of time to to try to learn what's going on, but rather they would like to, you know, do a few clicks and the job is done, and then they move to the to something else, right? And in our case, since it was a lot of machine learning, a lot of predictions, there was this problem of trust to the system because although they could use it in this way that I've just described, that okay, they could just do some clicking and then complete the task within I don't know 15 minutes maybe. But nonetheless, they were hesitant to use it because there was, you know, this lack of trust to the system. They would question why the prediction is maybe a little higher than they expect or a little lower. And there was no way to explain it to them. <laughs> well, you basically say, okay, it's an algorithm. And so th- this, this aspect was, I guess, quite crucial because on, in their mind, they also have a certain number of rules that they follow when when they do the planning, right? So and this is basically a kind of an invite for the next question, so to say, about the explainable AI that we try to we try to show the end users, you know, various types of explanations later in order to kind of gain more trust from their side. Yeah, finally, I, I guess as I said at the beginning, this phrase that if we, if we have AI in the data product, then they will use it. Let's just build it. <laughs> Well, in the end, we've learned that it's, of course, not the case. And uh, people first were very skeptical, but later we tried to really work hand in hand with them, trying to kind of polish each single feature that they had in their mind. And this way, we brought in more people who tried the product. Hit the nail on the head there with uh, these technologies. Whatever's new, you know, as, as we talk right now, you know, AI is definitely high on the hype cycle and the assumption, you know, that it's not magic sauce, right? You don't just kind of stick it into the cake and then all of a sudden everything is solved. You still need to map these technologies onto to fit the tool into the way the, the customer wants to, to use it. So in this case, is this, did you guys ever look at like how, did you model the way the tool does your modeling? Is it based on how, like, for example, a purchaser all the factors that they were, uh, you know, using, whether it was at the calculator or some kind of manual process in Excel, I imagine that they had some kind of recipe that they would follow to do this prior to you doing any type of AI or machine learning to help with that decision support. So is that how you helped, you know, get adoption to be higher? Was Is it modeled on that? Or were you looking at other data? I'm curious, especially around like, if there's experience or Maybe, I don't know if you'd call it bias, but there might be like factors, uh, decision points that a human would be using in the traditional or the old way that they used to do those tasks that you can't maybe perhaps integrate into the model. Does that make them not trust it as much, even if maybe you're actually factoring in more variables that they never used to? Like, oh, well, you never had weather when you forecasted crop prices to figure out how much to purchase or whatever. You never had that. And we, we actually provide that, but we don't have, you know, 
I don't know, last month's purchase. So you don't know what the price was last month. I mean, that's a bad example. But can you, are you following what I'm saying? Can you talk a little bit to that in terms of adoption? Before we even started, people were able to plan different promotions over the last, well, I don't know how many years. And the main tool that they used was Excel. People with a great number, number of you know, years of experience, they put together all these data sets for themselves. And they've developed a certain kind of a tactics for how to approach the planning, so to say, right? And don't forget, Lidl is operating in yeah, about 30 countries, and each country has its own secret sauce, <laughs> so to say, how to, wow. to, to, how to do the planning. As I said, at, at the beginning, we had one person from one of the countries, one real planner who, was, who showed us how he does it for real what factors they consider, his logic. And then we try to kind of mimic the, the, the whole thing using machine learning algorithms. And of course, machine learning can take into account a lot more different factors than you know, human planners. But nonetheless, the kind of the, the results that we got were, of course, slightly different because you know, human planners, they, they, I mean, it's impossible to get the same number. <laughs> for a human and a machine learning algorithm. And then they, they would always kind of say, okay, why is it so, so lower than I expect? I need to understand why. And then, again, the only answer we had at the moment at the time was, okay, because the model said so. And this is, that, that was cer certainly not enough for them. Just recently, we, we, kind of, we developed quite a good relationship with uh, Polish planners, and they had... They are similar concerns. So they, they tried the tool, they like the tool, but again, for them, it's somewhat hard to, to, to get, get the trust, in, to start trusting the, the system immediately, right? They, they tried to plan some, some promotions and it was, it was fine for them, but for some of them, they got unexpected results. And here where you kind of, you, you hit the wall, right? They start asking you all these con contra for all sorts of co contrastive explanations. What if if it was different? Then what would have happened? And without explainable AI or any kind of explanation of your machine learning AI, you, you just cannot go forward with them, right? This is how I would put it. I do want to get into that, the, the explainable AI piece. I'm curious, though, you, you mentioned Lidl's in 30 countries. so. Like, for example, the, the purchasing department here, are there really 30 different recipes that are valid and or there are cultural distinctions in the way stock is purchased for stores in Germany versus Poland? Or is it just that these kind of these heuristics or these the models for doing this were kind of organically born in different ways in each place? So are, are you guys trying to centralize that or are you creating unique models that are, you know, are you trying to map it on to like in order to get the Polish buyer to trust us, we need to show that our model is based on the way they were doing it, even if it's a different model than we use in Germany or Italy. Like, can you talk a little bit about how you make those decisions and how you keep that trust that people are going to still use these decision support tools? Yes, as I, as I said at the beginning, the, each country has its small kind of a feature when they do the planning of promotions. And Lidl is currently developing various tools in order to standardize this process, but it is kind of an ongoing thing. Like with any, you know, person, be it a promotion planner or I don't know, a bank teller or whatever, right? People are usually quite, they tend to oppose changes, right? They just don't buy it in many cases. And it takes quite a lot of time in order to convince them that, okay, this is the, the right way to do things, that this is you know, something we are suggesting you a new way that is not really new. It's just kind of more generic, so to say. Yeah, nonetheless, they would they usually say that, okay, we have this one data point that it must be everywhere. Otherwise, we just don't take it. <laughs> so it is really kind of a matter of, matter of time, matter of interaction with the client, trying to convince them that if it's so important, then we can build it in into the tool then they then they will go along and then they, they they will buy it, or on the other hand, try to convince them that it's not important. And okay, then maybe they at some point they will get convinced. <laughs> the, the, these are the all, all different types of things that you have to kind of discuss with the customer 
you know, one-on-one, so to say. So we, we actually do a lot of traveling these days, going to Bulgaria, going to Poland, Hungary, every country. We try to talk to these people directly, try to get the requirements directly from them, and then show again the results back to them. Such so as, okay, we did it for you specifically, so let, let, let's work together. I think it's great that you're going out and doing that, you know, one-on-one, you know, research with your with your customers because that's another way to just build support is when they feel like they're being included in the process and you're not imposing a tool, but you're actually modeling a tool based on them. That's a, that's another way to increase engagement. I'm curious, are do you find that the unique countries, the 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 managers or whoever whoever ultimately makes the decision on what tools or what model is going to be used to make the final decisions? Are they interested in like, oh, like, look, Italy factors in, you know, the weather or they, they factor in this thing that we never thought to do or we never really gave it that much weight. Like maybe we should do it that way. Is it kind of 30 independent recipes? And then you guys have been generalizing that based on kind of the variables that you find have the most impact on the quality of the predictions. And do you, is that like shared and, and the countries are aware of what each other are doing? Or is it more like, yeah, 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 that's nice, but Poland's different. We want to do it this way, and we know it's right. It depends. I mean, sometimes there are certain legal things that we have to take into account that are not quite transferable across different countries. So these things, we simply kind of, we just cannot take them into account <laughs> because then then the tool becomes too specific for each country. But on the other side, the things that we are able to generalize, we we just do it simply by trying to get more data from countries or you know buying data or something like that so talk to me about how explainable ai this technology so if i can just for people that don't know what this is effectively we're talking about when you're when you're doing things like showing a prediction from a model it's actually showing what some of the criteria were and and perhaps how they were weighted or how they had an impact on the conclusion that was derived by the system. Is that is that a fair summary of what explainable AI is? Well, why don't you tell us instead of me me trying to do it, since you're you're this is a in a space that you're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. The area that news kind of a research area of explainable AI is it's all about trying to understand the reasoning of, of a black box model. Right. This is not a new idea. So it it was quite popular back in the nineties, but then was somehow forgotten and it, it resurfaced back in 2016 17 when DARPA announced a lot of funding for the for this area of explainable AI so what it actually does is for instance let's say you have a data scientist working on a sophisticated model could that be I don't know a neural network or anything else and then it produces a prediction which is just a single number right or it's a binary decision, yes or no. In many cases, these black box models are really hard to explain to a non-expert. Even data scientists in many cases don't know why it predicted yes versus no. There is no clear explanation or human readable explanation that can be delivered in this case, right? And and the the whole area and of research of explainable AI is trying to first of all come up with the whole philosophy of what an explanation really is, and this is not a done deal, I would say. People are still trying to understand what is a real, what it really means. And the second part is, okay, how do we generate something that a human being can understand? Let it be, I don't know, some factors. Okay, for this prediction, I don't know, factor eight played the biggest role, and then factor B played somewhat lesser role, and so on and so on or even generate a sequence of rules, if-else rules, such that, okay, if, I don't know, weather is temperature, air temperature, you know, it's higher than 30 degrees, and, I don't know, it's middle of the day, then the, the prediction for the sales of ice cream will be high. And then what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we, we use this sort of uh, techniques in order to interact with our customers. So, for instance, when you go and talk to a uh, operational person, you know, a person who works in operations, who has in mind a certain number of basic rules, I know, three, five, six rules when doing a planning. And then when you come to him with a machine learning model, something that is a black box, 
and then you tell them, okay, just trust my prediction, then in most of the cases, it just simply doesn't work. They just don't trust it. But the moment when you come with an explanation for every single prediction your model does, you are kind of increasing your chances of a mutual conversation between this person and responsible person and the model in this case. So for instance, if, if the model predicts, I don't know, sales one, two, three, four, five for the May, uh, for the May of June, and then it says, okay, why is it one, two, three, four, five? And then you say, okay, it's because if temperature, well, not temperature in this case, probably it's too, too far, but I don't know if regular sales in June are you know, greater than two, three, four, and I know it's May of June and something else, something else. And then this person can relate these if else statements to something that he has in mind when doing planning himself. This is where this kind of a, the eureka moment happens, so to say, because they, they see that the model is reasoning in a, in a similar way as they do it. And this way, the level of trust certainly goes up. And then they're willing to try it even more. And I'm aware of you know similar similar stories. For for instance, Yandex has has been in the business of building similar tools for their customers, and they also have explanation modules. So it's not a um, kind of a one shot thing that we do at Leal, but it's kind of a gaining quite a lot of momentum, I guess. And I, I think that's natural that. Trust and engagement is likely to go up if you have this in place, right? Because as you said, people can see that the tool is modeled on the work and the tasks that they want to do. And it's not, it's not imposing a magic answer completely based on, it's kind of like saying, hey, none of, none of your experience for the last 10 years of running promotions at Lidl matters anymore. Here's what you should do. Here's the product and here's the sale price and how long you should run it for. And there, I, I think there's an, it's just a human nature. There's a natural tendency to not want to trust that, wow, my whole job and my whole, the, these activities I do are completely replaceable by a magic box. But when people start to see how it's actually a decision support, I think it's natural that that trust goes up. Although having said that, I'm curious, you're using some of this. Is this, would you say this is a regular ingredient in the products that you bake up at Lidl, the data products that you guys are working on these tools, or is this a, you know, occasional thing? And why, why or why not would it be included on, on everything if it's possible? Well, there are different cases. So certainly explainable AI is not something that you should or must use in every situation, but I'm a great believer in decision support tools and the human in the loop applications. So not necessarily in retail, but in, I mean in general. Every time where people have to look at certain predictions, we try to come up with explanations or at least some sort of a strategy for, okay, how can we come up with these explanations? On the other side, these techniques are very useful when you do debugging of machine learning models. So even if you if you are not planning to show this explanation to anybody in the business, you are still benefiting quite a lot when you're actually developing a, a machine learning model by by using these tools. Sort of just to throw in a few words, kind of you can avoid all sorts of you know overfitting in your model or removing some funny features that actually <laughs> I don't know make your model unstable and so on and so on. So it, I think the, the the main point here is that in order to we build things, <laughs> models, but we don't really understand a lot of what is really going on inside when, when they make predictions. So it would be really sad. That's the main idea. I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I could see how even as a debug, it could be useful, you know, as you're, as you're trying to improve the quality of the, of the decision, you know, the advice that the tool is generating. Do you find that Maybe I don't know if you have any data or even if it's just kind of qualitative in nature, but having included this on any of the products that are that are at Lidl, do you find people trust like once they've seen that like you know the the model is has there's some explainability behind you know the predictions that are being made, do they tend to still pay attention to all of that going forward, or is it more like, oh, I can see that you know, Andre and his team factored in, you know, 
whatever date, you know, last month's purchase data plus our competitor data. And that's what I always do. And now that I know that he always does that, I don't really need to see that every time. I don't, I'm not going to second guess as much as I used to. I'm going to kind of trust it now going forward. Or do you find that that the explainable AI, the, that portion of the UI is actually an integral part of using the tool every time? Are you following what I'm saying? It's kind of that, do you start to ignore it over time or do you really look, do, do customers see that as like an ongoing useful aspect of the interface? The thing that we, we don't have the explainability built in into the user interface at the moment. We kind of we, we have it as a more POC kind of we, we show it on demand more or less, but we don't have it as a as a as a uh, you know default feature. Like certainly this should be it should be working in in, in the way that you described. I've, I've actually read a few papers recently about um, the effects of explainability. Sort of the, the people were tested. Through I don't know, don't remember exactly the the test setup, but the point that the researchers were making was that the the accuracy of predictions in the human within this uh, realm of human in the loop applications does not go up. So whenever people use a machine learning model that makes a prediction yes versus no, it altogether the the performance of this bland human and machine <laughs> does not go higher, <laughs> but well significantly that they could prove it. But the trust into the system can be goes by twenty percent higher than than without any explanation. I guess what you said is is exactly is the point of of building in explainable AI into any tool, right? To make it transparent, and then it, if at some point people trust it, then they don't really have to check these explanations every single time because they know, okay, we are on the same page, machine and me. Unless they're trying to explore some unusual situation where they really want to test the system or learn something from, from that. Because, well, this is also a possibility, right, for, for human and the loop applications. So when humans actually learn something new from, from the system. So I think this is an, another case when they would use it occasionally after that. You're listening to Experiencing Data, the podcast that explores how design and user experience make enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. Your host is Brian O'Neill of Designing for Analytics, designer, UX consultant, and advisor to the business leaders behind custom enterprise data products and analytics applications. For more information, visit designingforanalytics.com. If you're enjoying the show, help Brian out by rating it on iTunes. And now back to Brian. Without getting too technical here, and obviously, you know, experiencing data, this podcast is more about customer experience with data products and that type of thing. But I'm curious, there, there may be listeners wondering, hey, you know, I, I have this decision support tool or this analytics deployment that's starting to use some machine learning. It doesn't have any type of explainability. We are, you know, we are seeing the same symptoms you talked about, like low engagement, people don't trust it you know, we've put this significant data science investment in place. Is it easy to retrofit in a technology investment you may have made to include some of this such that you might be able to start to improve the trust factor? Or is this is this something that really needs to be implemented from the start and it's it's much more difficult to put in after the fact? It all depends on the on the system itself, right? How, how many models you have there and what is the and of complexity of the whole thing. Technically speaking, there are already a number of libraries available for, for doing these these things. Everything is open source. You can just Google for, you know, words like Lime or Shap or Anchor or, or contact me in LinkedIn, for instance. I, I could point you out at a, um, various sources. But the point of the explainable AI is that these tools are sort of model agnostic in the sense that they just need a prediction and they they need they need just a model right and the predictions that these model that model produces and that's pretty much all right then you can write a few few lines of python and or r and then it it's there you can get your explanations the short answer is there is no kind of you don't have to invest too much into getting explanations once you if you already have a, a working system. 
wow, that's it's kind of like a little bit mind boggling. So if you hear in, in terms of why isn't this being used more? Is there an, is there a perception that it's costly or or it's more difficult than it is? Or is the quality not there? Or do you think, you know, the the business and the leaders and the people doing this don't think it's necessary? Like it, it kind of fascinates me if it's that simple and if the quality, if this is such an easy way to build trust, why is this not happening more? Like did something happen in the night between the 90s and now that that this kind of fell out of trend or I don't know, can you talk to that a little bit? In my personal opinion, I think over the recent 10 years, data scientists kind of put too much attention into getting high performance, high model performance in terms of accuracy or lower error. And this whole trend, you know, of Kaggle competitions where you try to build super, super accurate model and say the opponent who gets the first prize is probably, I don't know, hundreds of a percent more precise than you. But the main question doesn't actually make sense. Is it what business really wants? In my opinion, it is not the case, right? In, yeah, for sort of scientific breakthrough, yeah, maybe, yes, it is useful. But certainly, if, in order to gain trust, you cannot just build more and more sophisticated or you know high precision model it it just leads you nowhere and the other thing is that over the last well five years the deep learning hype took place and a lot of attention was in the deep learning kind of area where people were all in you know doing neural networks and nobody really cared about explainability it's more okay let's just predict this you know, to 99.9 <laughs> percent of the accuracy at some point, you know, some executives realize that, okay, we have a lot of these models and we have no idea what, what is really going on inside of them. Yeah, as I mentioned, the DARPA program and also the GDPR regulation that came to light in May 2018 put in the spotlight the, the right to explainability, the right to explanations. So all of these factors together kind of propelled the explainable AI topic forward and it's now getting a lot more attention than before. In terms of the, you know, when you get into our neural nets and some of those technologies, is this technology available to products that are leveraging neural networks and, and some of these more complicated artificial intelligence technologies? Is it widely available to add the explainability portion? Well, it, it depends what kind of data you're working with. If you're working with, you know, this regular table or data, you know, the, the data that is, you know, in table, tables. Not no text, no images, then it doesn't really matter. You can take a neural net or any any other model. But once you go into more, you know, the sophisticated realm of I don't know, neural nets working with text data, then it is slightly more complicated to get it to work. But there's still it's still possible, right? So the packages like Climb or Shap can. It's very interesting what they do actually. For instance, if you try to say, classify legal documents or medical documents or, say, fake news classification or anything, right? Yes versus no. Then these explainability tools can highlight the actual words in the sentence that play the most role in terms of, okay, if it's you know, fake news, then it will underline certain words that, okay, the human being can look at them and say, okay, this content is more, maybe more full of feelings or calling for action or something like that versus, I don't know, you know, a prediction for no fake, then it's mostly facts, facts, facts. And then basically the explainability tools, they highlight words in, in sentences. And in terms of images, it's even more complicated. There are a lot of things that are model agnostic, but even more things that are not. <laughs> and in this case, you really have to be an expert in whatever, you know, neural net and try to get it to work, just get a code from GitHub and try to reproduce the results of a research paper. For these more complicated cases, it's not that easy, but but it's possible, right? You brought up something too, which is, and I've heard this trend repeated too, that there can be a, a tendency for in the data science community to want to do excellent data science work and not necessarily do excellent business work, you know, building tools and solutions that, that help the business. So I, I could see how 
you know, maybe some data scientists may see that's not going to improve the model, adding the explainability. So, and I would, you know, that's, I can't write a paper on that and get, <laughs> you know, build my credentials or something, you know, with that type of information. So maybe that's responsible for what, for why it's not as widely in use. But do, do you think that's going to change? Do you think this will become more of an expectation going forward that we, we won't be talking about black boxes as much uh, in a year from now or two years from now? Do you think that'll start to go away and, the, and expectations will change? Or any thoughts on that? The whole trend is going in the direction of, you know, explainable AI anyways, for one simple reason. So in, in the last years, the, you know, AI was mostly a used in the labs and probably to automate certain processes where no humans were really involved, right? So it's more like robotics or something like that, right? But these days, AI is going in, into various fields like, you know, healthcare or legal domains, right? Where you deal with things that are, you know, affect humans directly. Or for instance, how would you explain why a certain person didn't get uh, a loan at a bank, right? And the other one who looks very much similar <laughs> got it, right? So there are a lot of questions that are coming up these days because AI is touching upon some, you know, points where humans are personally involved, right? Because, yeah, we don't really care how some robot is moving goods at Alibaba warehouse. I mean, do we need explainability for that? Yeah, maybe it's a really, really sophisticated model, but I don't care. I, I get my goods, <laughs> I order them, and that's it, right? But whenever things, you know, go into the direction of you know some social interactions or things that affect people people directly, or say these high stake decisions, then interpretability and explainability is a must. So, and I think many people would probably choose a model that is maybe not as exact and accurate, but explainable <laughs> versus something that is extremely <laughs> accurate, but okay, sometimes it can kill you, <laughs> right? It's um, this kind of a logic here. That's kind of that dividing line, right? Between the business and the human side of it and the pure data science side is that, you know, you might have a super, super ap accurate model, but if you find out that they're still buying carrots the old way, <laughs> Does it really matter that you give them an excellent prediction on how many carrots to buy or at what price if they don't ever take advantage of that? All that investment is kind of thrown out the door. So from a business standpoint, an, an acceptable model quality with a highly trusted interface and user experience might be the better business decision, even if it's not the best you know, model quality from a pure math perspective. So I, th I think that's important stuff to, to consider in all of this as we build, build these tools. This is awesome. I'm, I'm, this is really, it's actually exciting from a, a design perspective to, to hear that this, this is available as kind of a tool that, that we can implement. Obviously, there's the context matters and you have to look at particular domains and particular types of data and, and all of that. But it sounds like something that, you know, it, as part of our toolbox, it's something that we should be leveraging uh, regularly when possible, especially if we're talking about human in the loop, you know, tools and, and decision support tools, as opposed to, as you said, the, the Ali, Alibaba robots. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Get my book or my shoes or whatever I ordered. So <laughs> do you have any, uh, just on this, this topic here, like kind of as we wrap up here, what, any advice for broad level advice, you know, for people that are kind of looking to jump into this on making efficient data products? And it doesn't have to be just about explainable AI, but just from your experience at Lidl, Maybe a mis mistake that you've you realized and you changed, and how you're approaching your projects and, and building these tools. Uh, any any advice for people? I guess the only advice I would give to anyone who wants to build a product that is used is to go to the people and ask for the actual requirements. Try to involve the end user at the earliest stage possible. I think this is the the only way to succeed in the end. And I mean, this is how, you know, startups fail or succeed, right? You you have to kind of really understand what what you're doing. And I think, so at, at Lidl, we've kind of cleared, <laughs> cleared the way from, you know, zero to here over the last three years. And we've learned it the hard way. The more you interact, I mean, it doesn't really matter to, to the people because data product is a piece of software, software that has you know machine learning inside of it. Well, algorithms, 
in the end. And nobody really cares about how sophisticated these algorithms are. It's just people just want to make sure that they can get their job done <laughs> efficiently or you know have a nice experience no bugs and stuff like that so this is all the same story as it was probably 10 years ago when we didn't build any data products but built you know just regular software but again the, the main advice is um just don't try to build the you know the create this moonshotty product out of within a few months and then try to Pray iterate that. and and <laughs> and try try to kind of onboard your users as early as possible this is the main advice and that I could give. And of course, <laughs> use explainable AI in order to convince and gain trust. This is a must in my view. I mean, of course, in the cases where you have to do it, I mean, not in the cases where, you know, someone is doing some, something and no one can see him. <laughs> so if, if it's an interactive tool, interacting with users, they have to be sure that it's doing the right thing. <laughs> Great advice and people that have been on my the designing frameworks mailing list and and uh, the experiencing data podcast have definitely heard this this advice beaten into the ground many times about getting out there and talking to people early in the process to inform what you're doing and and not working in isolation because that's that's almost a sure way to produce something that people aren't going to use because it's full of your own bias about how things should be done and it's not informed by what you know, your, your customer wants to do. So good words, good parting advice. Where can people find out more about you? Do you, are you on uh, Twitter? Do you have a website, LinkedIn, anything, anything like that? Well, I'm posting quite a lot on LinkedIn and I have a um, group dedicated to explainable AI. It's called, the, well, explainable AI dash XAI. Everyone who is interested in learning more, you feel free to join or contact me through LinkedIn. I don't tweet much on Twitter and um, my presence is mostly <laughs> on LinkedIn at the moment. Great. Well, I'll, I'll definitely put those uh, links to your profile and to the explainable AI group on LinkedIn in the show notes. So, wow, this has been uh, really great, Andre. It's been great to talk to you and thanks for coming on Experiencing Data. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for inviting me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.